So we have already done Newton's laws of motion and now we are trying to apply Newton's laws to specific situations. So this is going to be a real life. And whenever you try to talk about Newton's laws or you talk about motion, there is always friction, isn't it? Friction cannot be avoided. There is always friction. So we have to talk about friction now. Now remember that friction does not depend on the area of contact. I think I already told, touched that, right? Friction does not depend on the area of contact. So that's what people think, students think, that if there is more area touching, then you think friction is greater, it's not. So if I have an object that's moving over a certain surface this way, you see the area of contact is that much, and then I make it move this way, assuming that is the same type of surface, you see, same type of surfaces, friction will be the same. It does not depend on the area of contact. So what does friction depend on? Friction depends on the weight, actually, but it's not correct to say weight. It is more perfect to say that friction depends on the normal reaction. Is the normal reaction equal to the weight? Yes, in one particular case. If it's on a flat surface, what's the weight of an object? If the mass is m, the weight is mg, isn't it? And in this particular case, the normal reaction is exactly equal to the weight. But what if it's on an inclined surface? Did the weight change? No. Did the normal reaction change? Yes. So in this case, friction changes. So it is very important to understand that friction depends on the normal reaction. What else does friction depend on? Surely it depends on the nature of the surfaces in contact, right? Whether it's wood on wood, whether it's uh, rubber on concrete, like tires on concrete, whether it's uh, dry concrete or it has been raining. So the nature of the surfaces always come into play. And that is going to be represented by a constant in the equation that you're going to see. In the equation, you're going to see a constant called mu. Mu is called the coefficient of friction. And again, there are two types of friction. One is kinetic friction. The other is static friction. Kinetic friction is also called sliding friction. What's the difference between the two? If an object is at rest, like this, in this case, is there friction? Yes. There is no relative motion between the two surfaces, but yet we know there is friction. This is static friction. What happens if I slowly start increasing an applied force on it? Like, if I start blowing on it, will friction be the same? No. <laughs> friction grows with the applied force. So if you start increasing, I mean, if you start applying an increasing force, then friction also starts increasing. But there is a limit. Just before motion begins, friction becomes a maximum. Now, all this time, the friction that existed was called static friction. What does the word static mean? Stationary. Stationary. Now, the maximum value of static friction is called limiting friction. You're going to see that. The maximum value of static friction just before motion begins is called limiting friction. And once motion begins, friction drops. And it's now called kinetic friction. The word kinetic means move. So remember that kinetic friction is always less than sliding, I mean uh, static friction. Kinetic friction is always less than static friction. And the formulas are the same for both. So on the left hand side you have force of friction. On the right side you have coefficient of kinetic friction. Mu k is coefficient of kinetic friction. Fn is the normal reaction. You could have a similar formula where you say FFR is equal to mu s Fn. That's the coefficient of static friction. And I'm going to give you some typical values for mu k so you can appreciate it. Rubber with concrete is a very interesting case, isn't it? Tires with concrete, the coefficient of kinetic friction 
if the concrete is dry, it's warm. But if it rains and the concrete is wet, definitely it's going to drop, isn't it? And it drops drastically. We do have to know that when we drive. Now it becomes 0 0.7. That's a 30% decrease. Friction is less. You have a bigger chance of slipping on a rainy day. Hydroplaning is not a joke. And to add to that, people make big mistakes. As soon as uh, you get into that situation of hydroplaning, some people jam the brakes bad. Number two, some people try to pull the steering to the opposite direction in which they are slipping. Major mistake. You have to, if it hydroplanes, you have to pull the steering to the side to which you are slipping. No, the human brain does not say that. You know, the human brain says, oh, go the other way and you're gone. You'll never come back, possibly. So friction is important. And this thing, everybody's heard of non-stick fans, haven't you? The material coated on non-stick is Teflon. And usually it's coated on steel. Teflon and steel exposed to air, which is usually the case. Look at the coefficient of friction. It's 0 0.04, no friction, almost no friction. That's why it does not stick. OK. <coughs> friction changes with applied force. And I've already told this. This is how the graph is going to look like. On the x-axis, you have applied force. And on the y-axis, you have the force of friction. Now, it's very clear that initially, assuming that you start from zero, as you increase the applied force, friction also increases, becomes a maximum. That is called the limiting friction. That number, that value is called limiting friction. And then, as motion begins, you see there is a drop. See that? So on the right side, you have kinetic friction. That's why I've drawn a dotted line there. Before that is static friction, and beyond that is kinetic friction. So kinetic friction is always less than static friction. I just wanted you to compare mu k and mu s again. Mu k had already told you the values, right? It was 1 and 0 0.7, but look at uh, static friction. Uh, it should have been the other way around. This is the question of kinetic friction, 0 0.8 and 0 0.5. Please change that. This, these are the values of kinetic friction, 0 0.8 and 0 0.5. What I gave you before was static friction because static friction has to be more than kinetic friction. Now, let me ask you one question. Usually when you're driving, and be careful on this, when you're driving on a freeway, what comes into play? Is it kinetic or static friction? And think before you answer. Are you, are you, you're just driving, normal driving, on a freeway. Static. So is this static friction or kinetic friction? When you're normally driving. Remember that the tires are not slipping on the road. They are just gripping the road. They're just gripping. You don't want them to slip. You want them to grip, which means there's no relative motion in that sense, unless they're slipping. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so it is static friction. It is not kinetic friction. And this explains why once you slip, it's very difficult for you to come back on track. Because once you begin slipping, it's kinetic friction. And kinetic friction is less than static friction. Now that should make it very clear. So once you begin to slip, you got you lost control already, and friction now is less than what you had before. Is that making sense? So that's why it's tough to regain control once the the car slips. Haven't you seen at least videos where, especially in snow or ice, people slip and then they keep going? I've seen several videos like that, and it looks funny. It's not funny for the person who's driving. <laughs> Because he's not able to regain because kinetic friction is less. So that's what all this is about. Circular motion is the next part. Circular motion. An object moving in a circle. 
Well, as represented in this diagram, the object, what direction is it rotating in clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. clockwise. And the arrows represent the velocity at any instant. And definitely it's a tangent drawn to the circle at that point. So at any point in circular motion, the velocity is along the tangent. So even if the magnitude is constant, you know, like if I have a string and there is a stone at the other end of it and I'm rotating it as smoothly as possible, okay, with the same speed, even if the magnitude is the same, if I ask you this question, is it accelerating, what will you say? Yeah. Is the object accelerating, I'm rotating it with a constant speed, not slowing it down, I'm not speeding it up, constant speed, is it accelerating? It's changing direction. Yes, because it is changing direction, it is accelerating. And we got to understand that. Velocity is a vector, isn't it? It has both magnitude and direction. Either one of those changes, velocity changes. That means it's either accelerating or decelerating, whatever. So when a body moves in a circle with a constant speed, it has an acceleration. But this acceleration is different from what we are used to. Now that's a problem. We are used to, oh, it has to change in number. No. Here it's changing in direction, isn't it? Therefore, this is a special type of acceleration. In the sense that the direction of this acceleration is going to be at right angles to the velocity. I'll say that again. The direction of the acceleration here is always going to be at right angles to the velocity. So which means, what's the direction of the acceleration? What is the line drawn at right angles to a tangent called? At any point. It's called the radius. I'll let you see it. Isn't the radius at 90 degrees to the tangent at that point? Therefore, although the velocities are, you know, constant in magnitude, as you can see, the length of the lines are equal. I've been careful. You see that? The length of the lines are equal. Okay. What would be the, I've not drawn it here, what will be the direction of acceleration? You see there, on the right hand side, am I not drawing parallel lines? Is, isn't this parallel to this? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this side, isn't that parallel to this? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So if you take a careful look, what will this give? What will this give? If this is V1, this is V2, which you're going to see, and hopefully you don't see the other part. I have to stop it on time. Okay, so that is V1 and V2. What is this vector represent is my question. See? What does that vector represent? Okay, let me help you out. Watch this carefully. If you add this and this, would you get this? All right, one more time. Isn't that how you take the resultant of two vectors? Yeah. Look at, look at, <laughs> yes. Look at this. Look at the, the direction of the arrow. Look at the direction of this arrow. And then look at this. So V1 plus something gives you V2, which means this is the difference between V1 and V2, which means that gives you the direction of the acceleration. Because what is acceleration? Isn't it change in velocity divided by time, of course, is a scalar. So now look at that carefully. Look at this carefully. Isn't it pointing towards the center of the circle? If that vector were drawn here, wouldn't it be pointing to the center of the circle? That's what I'm talking about. So the direction of the acceleration is towards the center of the circle, always. Therefore, it's called radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration. Centripetal. Okay, you'll see that in writing. Let me complete this. So that is a change in velocity, delta V there. 
which is v1 minus v2 or v2 minus v1 either way and now I'm completing the I've called the radius of the circle r here and this angle will this be the same as this angle please should be. So I'm going to call it delta theta. Both cases, the angles are the same. And if I were to join, I'm going to do that sometime. If I were to, watch this. If I were to join A and B, wouldn't I get a triangle here which is similar to this triangle? Yes. And once you have two similar triangles, you do know that the ratio of the corresponding sides must be equal. That's what I'm going to do. So I take this side divided by any one of this is equal to, on this side, on this triangle, it's going to be, you see that, change in length by the radius. You said any side? Any side, because remember both these sides are equal? equal okay. Yeah. Isn't that the case even here? Yeah. So that's very clear. It should make perfect sense. Change in velocity divided by any one of these sides is equal to the change in length divided by any one of these sides. Right, that, that should really be sensible. And then rearrange that. If you take the velocity to the right side, that's just simple math. You get that, don't you? They are equal. The ratio of the corresponding sides are equal. Okay, so I've just taken this velocity to the other side. Now, how do we get acceleration from here? What do we have to do to get acceleration from this quantity? Divided by time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, and if I set limit delta t tends to zero, then I'm going to get the instantaneous acceleration. That's what I'm going to do. So the radial acceleration, limit delta t tends to zero of delta v by delta t, that's what we're looking for. That is called the radial acceleration or the centripetal acceleration. On the right side, write the same thing. Except you divide by delta t. Does anybody recognize what this is? Uh, what this quantity is? Take a look. What is this quantity? Displacement by time. Isn't it displacement by time? That's velocity. So that means it became v squared by r. That's it. That's the formula for radial acceleration. Because limit delta t tends to zero, change in length by time is what is called the instantaneous velocity. And if that is the radial acceleration, what will be the force? Don't you know that wherever there's an acceleration, there's a force? What do you have to do to the acceleration to get the force? What's the formula for net force? Multiply by, Multiply by the mass of what, in this case? The mass of the object that's moving around in a circle. So if you do that, you will get the centripetal force. So what's the formula for centripetal force? mv squared by r. That's it. So remember that, centripetal force is mv squared by r. The question that he asked is, what happens if the velocity changes in magnitude as well? Right? Here we are assuming that the velocity was constant in magnitude, right? But the question is, what happens if it changes, like you begin rotating it slowly and then you speed it up in magnitude as well? Then it has another type of acceleration, which is called the tangential acceleration. Which means that acceleration is along the tangent because it involves a change in the magnitude of the velocity. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the angle between the tangential and the radial acceleration? Of course, 90 degrees. Do they affect each other? No. Because the x and y components are independent of each other. So we will bring that into the case a little later on, but already this might be a little tough for some people. When your car takes a curve, don't you want a centripetal force? You do. Now, let me ask you this. Assuming that the road is just flat at the curve, which we know is not, right? We know that at the curve, 
the outer side of the road is a little raised than the inner side. Don't we know that? We'll come to that in a moment. But just assume that the engineer who built it did not do it. Okay, so it's a flat road. And you're not driving so fast. Is there any chance that you can take the curve if you're not driving too fast? Sure. Yes. yes, because of friction. Come on, listen now. Friction helps you to stay on the road. Now tie this with Newton's first law of motion. What's Newton's first law of motion? An object continues to move in a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. Tie them together. Do you want this to go along a straight line? Or do you want it to go around the curve? Now you get it. See, if you wanted to take that curve, then you need an external force. If there's absolutely no external force, it'll go in a straight line. You won't be on the road. Now that external force is provided in this particular case by what? Friction. Friction. But what happens if you make the outer side higher than the inner side? We'll come to that in a moment. Okay? But before that, let's take a particular case of an object moving in a vertical circle. Like you have a string, a stone attached, and you rotate it in a vertical circle. Let's look at that case. You know what I mean, right? You could rotate it this way. So, and we'll look at two points, the highest point and the lowest point. So again, what's the situation? A string, a stone at one end, you hold the other end in your hand, and you rotate it in a vertical circle. That's one. Okay, let's look at the forces. Remember that the weight of an object always acts... Can you complete the sentence? The weight of an object always acts vertically down. So the two arrows that show downwards, you see that's mg, that's the weight. And what about this? That's also the weight. And there is a string, the tension in the string, if you're listening to me, the tension in the string is the centripetal force, and therefore it has to act towards the center of the circle. So, see, there's no cramming required here. So that's why the tension, Ft1, is towards the center of the circle. And what about this? That's also towards the center of the circle. Will the tension at the top and the bottom be the same? Practically, will it be the same? Hello, if at all the string has a chance of breaking, where do you think it will break? Come on now, be, oh, wake up. Where do you think the string would break? Let's say you keep on increasing the speed of rotation and the string is not so strong. It has a chance of breaking. At what point will it break? Are the highest or the lowest? lowest. The lowest point. We're going to find out why. So these are the tensions and the weight there. At A, can you give me an equation for... What's the net force at A? Yeah, don't you see that both are acting in the same direction? So to take the net force, what do you do? You add them up because they're both in the same direction. So when you add them up and set it equal to mv1 squared by r, what is v1? It's the velocity at the highest point. Okay. What, what about the equation at the lowest? I think you can write it on your own, can't you? At the lowest point, what would you do? You, now you see that the two are not in the same direction. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Therefore, you would go take the difference. F T2 minus mg. Do you think the velocity will be the same? Do you think the object will have the same velocity as at the top? Come on now. Come on. No, if you say no, where do you think it will be higher? I'm giving you so many chances to think. Where do you think this object will have a higher velocity when it passes through the highest point or the lowest point? That's a, the lower point because the action of gravity. If nothing else, right? Speeds it up, okay. So those are the equations. Now, if you start slowing it down, let's say you slow it down. At which point? Do you have a chance of the string slackening? Slowly, highest point. highest point. So we're going to find the minimum speed when it slackens. When you say it slackens, or what do you mean? What's the tension? Exactly when it begins slackening, what's the tension? Zero. Zero. So that's what we're going to do. So minimum speed at A, because we know it's going to slacken at A. 
And we know that happens when ft1 is zero. In that case, from the top equation, definitely this is zero, so this is equal to this, and suddenly we can find the speed. The masses cancel out, and you get square root gr, yes. So it depends on the length of the string, doesn't it? Yes. That's what you see, square root of the product of g and r. Simple thing. I ask you, do you understand the situation here, the diagram? What direction is the object moving? Is it moving into the plane of the board or out of the plane of the board? I want to see whether you understand. Definitely this object is not sliding down an inclined plane. Come on, man, it's a freeway. You have your car going on the freeway. The outer side, okay, the outer side is raised than the inner side. The object is moving out of the plane of the board. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. But most students would not see that. They would say, you don't want your car to slip down the road and into the ditch by the side. <laughs> you, go you got it? That's a special case. The object is not going down the inclined plane, out of the plane of the board. Okay, what are those vectors there? What is this vector? That's the weight. And what is this? The normal reaction. Yes, let's label them. Now you see the normal reaction broken up into its components. So you have Fn, and don't question me on this, please. <laughs> that angle is theta. From your geometry, you should understand that this component is Fn cos, and the other is Fn sine. Let me stop there and show you, because this angle is going to be theta. And I'll help you out a little bit, although I said don't question me. Look carefully. If this is theta, this is also going to be theta, isn't it? because they are alternate angles. Parallel lines, alternate angles. And if that's theta, surely this is also theta, because you have a set of two lines at right angles to each other. Do you see that? Do you see what I'm doing? These two are at right angles. These two are also at right angles. So this angle is what? Theta. Therefore, this becomes the adjacent side. This becomes what? Fn cos, and this becomes Fn Sign. Now take a careful look at this and tell me, assuming that uh, your tires are really bad and assuming there's no friction, no friction, okay? Is there any chance of your car remaining on the road? Take a careful look at this picture. Where's the center of the curve? Where is the center of the curve? The curve is this way, isn't it? By now everybody understood the curve is this way. Where's the center? That's all right. Come on. And do you see Fn sine theta? What's the direction of Fn sine theta? That's the curve. That's the center. That's where your car is. I was saying if there was no Fn sine theta, you would go straight according to Newton's law, off the road. I tried. Did you understand this? So look at Fn sine theta. What's it doing? It is providing the centripetal force. Therefore, what's the formula for centripetal force? V square. M V squared by R. So in the next step, I'm going to write Fn sine theta is equal to MV squared by R. If you understood, you enjoy it. Otherwise, you cram, you know, which is not good. Yeah, Fn sine theta. I don't know. Why. Okay. So Fn sine theta is... Now let me also tell you one thing. When theta increases, what happens to sine theta? Theta zero, sine zero is? Zero. zero. As theta increases, what happens to sine theta? It increases. And when it increases, do you see that the component towards the center is also increasing? So bigger the curve. When I say bigger the curve, that means smaller the radius. Smaller, that's a sharp curve, isn't it? We're going to... Prove that. Wait till the end, please. Come on. Let's finish this. Fn sine theta is equal to mv squared by r, right? And what's the vertical component doing? Because probably your question will be answered. What is the vertical component doing? Look at the diagram. Do you want your car to jump up while taking the curve? So don't you want these to be balanced? 
Yes. So F and cost that balances the weight. Neither do you want unnecessary stress on your tires, do you? You want them to be balanced. Okay. Otherwise your tires will wear. And if you divide those two, surely you're going to get Fn cancelled and tan theta is V squared by Rg. So when the engineer decides on the angle of banking, this is the angle of banking. He assumes that intelligent people are going to drive at a maximum speed. Because these two are constant for a curve, aren't they? Hello? Aren't they? So the only thing that you could change when you're driving around that curve is the velocity. And the banking has been done for a particular maximum speed. And if you go over that speed, it's dangerous because, remember, this is squared. Do you see that? And you go off the road. On top of that, if it has been raining, because in real life you also get friction to help you out. That saves you. But let's say it's been raining and you have bad tires and you, the maximum speed limit is 70 and you're driving at 100. That's the last day you'll be driving. Did it make sense? But if it's a, it's a person on a bicycle, he doesn't need the road to be banked because he banks himself. Or a motorcycle. Haven't you seen those guys when they take a real sharp curve, they go, oh. you see what they're doing? And they bend inwards, providing that component which balances, uh, uh, which provides the centripetal force. That's what I meant. Clear enough? Everything? Okay. Wonderful. Well, this was one of the questions on the quiz. That's why I included this, and the other class did not get it. They struggled. Terminal velocity is a high school topic. I think you heard about it. Do you, have you? Has anybody? What does the word terminal mean? Somebody has a terminal illness means that's the end, isn't it? The word terminal means until the end. Now, terminal velocity is the velocity that is maintained until the end. And here again, students have a big misunderstanding. Okay. <laughs> Don't just be writing, because this is again an important thing. Is there any difference between these two words, rest and equilibrium? Any difference? When, some, when somebody dies, you say he's laid to rest. That's correct. No more forces acting. Rest is absolutely no movement when there are no forces, which you cannot realistically talk about in physics because there are always some forces, isn't it? So in physics, we talk about equilibrium. And that's of two types. It's, there is static and dynamic. You know, students always think about static equilibrium, where there is, there is an object, two equal and opposite forces act on it, two equal and opposite forces. What happens to this? It doesn't move, correct? That is static equilibrium. My, now, my question is, is there a chance that the two forces acting on an object are equal and opposite, but still it's moving. Is there any chance? And if it is moving, what will its acceleration be? Yeah. You have to listen carefully. Now, the first question was this. Is there a chance of an object moving even if the forces acting on it are equal and opposite? You heard me? You told me yes, that's correct. That is a case of dynamic equilibrium. Second question. If that's the case, because the net force is zero, what should be the acceleration? Zero. Which means it's moving at constant velocity. That is called the terminal velocity. Best example, raindrops. They come from way high above, right, from the clouds. And the initial velocity is zero. But as it comes down, there is air resistance, and the density of air is increasing. Therefore, the air resistance, which is the drag force, you heard me? The drag force is increasing. The drag force is proportional to the velocity. That's a constant. Okay, an opposite, because these two are vectors. 
If the velocity is down, the drag forces up, resisting it. That's why when you're driving your car, there is, to get maximum mileage, you should not drive at 120 miles per hour. Because, you see the drag force increases with velocity. That neither does that mean that you have to drive at 10 miles per hour. Because then, you waste a lot of energy due to other accounts, okay? So don't question me on that. But there is a limit. So as the raindrop comes down, what's happening to the drag force? Because its velocity is increasing, what's happening to the drag force? It's increasing. But its weight is a constant, isn't it? Therefore, soon you will see that the drag force becomes equal to its weight. By that time, it's already moving with a certain velocity. Did anybody understand what I'm saying? Okay, let me try this one more time. It's coming down. The drag force is increasing because its velocity is increasing. And at one stage, the drag force has become exactly equal to its weight. Do you think it will stop right there? <laughs> no. It will continue moving to the end with the velocity that it has. That is called the terminal velocity. There you go. That is the terminal velocity. So F drag is minus BV. With B is a constant. MG is the weight. They are equal. When they become equal to each other, net force is zero, therefore the acceleration is zero. Which means it's moving at constant velocity. And this is called the terminal velocity. So thank you so much and listen to this and share this and you know, like it and post comments. Thank you. So this is exactly what I was... Let me get this out of the way. I don't want this graph. Okay. Object sliding down a plane. We already looked at this, but this may be technically neat where you understand everything. So another chance. The weight of the object, mg is acting down, vertically down, resolved into mg sine theta, mg cos theta. Friction is always against motion, right? And friction is mu times fn, where fn is the normal reaction, and it's equal to mg cos theta. You see that? So, so, and now the net force along the x-axis is mg sine theta minus friction because they are in opposite directions which should be equal to ma and of course the net force along the y is zero which we have already take, made use of here haven't we to write that and then I asked you this to push it up the plane the only difference is that the applied force has to now fight both and uh, you have to be careful. How are you pushing? You're pushing parallel to the plane, isn't it? What if, if you were pushing in a different direction? What if you were pushing like this? Oh, that becomes like, watch. What if you are applying a force this way? Then wouldn't you have to resolve the applied force into two components? You have a question like that on one of the labs. Remember that every lab has a last question, uh, which is a problem, and that carries at least five points on the lab. So this question on that lab, the friction lab, carries ten points. It's a wonderful one, because the force is applied not parallel to the plane, but applied this way. And make sure you do it. Okay, this time, if it is... Applied along the plane, then this is the applied force, isn't it? No questions, no doubts, everything clear, we're ready to do problems, aren't we?